we were getting ready to uh, talk about a certain uh, thing in Galatians 5.20, whenever we left off last. If we want to turn to Galatians 5.20... We had gone through a number of the sins of the flesh. Things that Paul says will keep us out of the kingdom of heaven. And I wanted to spend a little bit more time on the last two in that verse. Divisions and parties. Uh, the parties in particular, we talked about the divisions. The divisions would be uh, the disunion within the body of Christ. That would be people, factions within a local congregation, which is what which is what that divisions, the word for divisions carries the meaning of. And uh, that's actually going to be the subject of our sermon tonight, is divisions within the body. Parties, the last one, is how that word is translated in the American Standard Version. And as it's and as it's translated in the American Standard, it appears to be a little bit unclear. Not exactly a, a really good translation of the original language there. The Greek word there carries the meaning of heresy or a sect. And the actual word that's there is a trans, you know, our word heresy is transliterated from that word. I can't pronounce it, but it's something like heresis or heresis her, or something like that is the Greek word there. And it is the Greek word that, that is translated heresy. Parties, in the correct sense of the original language, would be groups of people who have separated themselves from the faith. Denominationalism falls into this category as well, if not more so than under the heading of, of divisions, which are, are divisions or separations of people within the body. Those who are involved with them are members of entire groups of people who have separated themselves from the body of Christ. That would be a denomination. It is interesting to note here that this word in the original language is also the word for heresy, which is how the King James Version and the New King James Version translate the word. If you're reading out of that translation, that last word in that sentence is translated uh, heresy. The New American Standard Bible renders the original word as factions. So that is probably in the original language the clearest verse of Scripture that we've got which condemns denominationalism. It would not do any harm to the text at all if that translation, instead of, of heresies, or factions, or parties, it would, it would not be a mistranslation to insert the word denominational, denominations, or denominationalism into that text. Go ahead, C.L. I mentioned before here, when I was a Boy Scout, we had, our scoutmaster was with the Baptist Church, that we would have like award ceremonies for the Boy Scouts and the Jet down there, and use their auditorium, and scouts every one big enough to get everybody in. But in their songbook, in the front of their songbook, they pledged their allegiance to the Mother Church, the Catholic Church. That was right in front of the Methodist song there. So this morning when I was coming down, the, I listened to KBT radio. On Sunday morning, church time, there's a Methodist preacher from Joplin. Well, they, sometimes he'll do, they, he was doing these prayers. He was saying them, and, and the audience was saying them with him. And then they was going to do communion. And he said, now, you don't have to be a member of this congregation or any congregation if you want to partake of it. This is open to you. But then when he starts doing it, same thing as a Catholic priest said, this is the bread, the body of Christ. That's only, or the body of Christ broken for you. Catholic priest, that's what they say. Then he picked up a cup, this is the blood of Christ. There was no thanks for the, for the bread, for the whatever. He was presiding over the Lord's Supper, just like the Catholic Church did. Right. Now, I, I couldn't see it to you know, see what I look like, but if you wanted to take of it, you could come forward and partake of it. If you didn't want to take of it, you could stay at your seat and this sort of stuff. And so, a denomination, I've talked to Earl's Bank today, a penny is the denomination of a dollar bill. It's, it's one hundredth of a dollar. So, if you're a denomination, you're still part of something else. You're just a division of it. 
Yeah, you're a division, and that's one of the and that's one of the uh, definitions of the word denomination yeah, see, there, there are in the dictionary. We call, what, what, what the other name we use for those people that are uh, what? They're not denominations. They're Protestants. They're protests against the church. Right. Well, apparently, part of them aren't Protestants. They're not protests against the church. They're so far of it. So. Well, not if they claim to be a part of the mother church. But. Yeah, you know, Well, and and that's and and therein lies the problem. They're teaching something that does not align with the whole Word of God. They are they'll pick bits and pieces of it out, and they will teach that, but they fail to uh, observe what I would call the whole counsel of God. They add to it, or they take away from it, and we've had a lot of lessons on that. And basically. We know from Scripture that the teachings of men render our worship vain, worthless. So in that sense, if you add something to it that you can't find in the Bible, I mean, that, that, that's how you tell if you've got the teachings of men or not, is you go by what's in the Bible only. Don't add anything to it. Don't take anything away from it. And then you know that you are following the Word of God only. And it says right in there that doing such things will render your worship vain. It's whenever Jesus was talking to the woman at the well, I believe, uh, when he said, In vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. If I've got that, if, if I've got that account right in Scripture. Uh, that's what this denominationalism is in this verse, are factions or divisions of people without whole groups of people who have separated themselves from the church and are teaching as a group some doctrine that either is a, that contains the commandments of men or has taken away from the word of God or leaves out some of the teachings of God or some of the will of God. So, like C.L. was pointing out there, uh, that group that he was talking about, there have, there have departed from the truth, and they have added things to their worship that, that, are, that is not authorized in the Scriptures, and they have fallen under the umbrella, you say, the jurisdiction of what Paul says here, factions, parties, groups of people, denominations. And he ends this up at the at the end of the next verse, some very strong words where he says, they who practice such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. So if we move into Galatians 5.21, we'll see the rest of them. We'll see some more of them. Envyings, uh, which means ill will or spite towards one another. Drunkenness, which means intoxication should be noted here that the state of being intoxicated is where the sin lies. Therefore, any substance which produced such an effect would be included in this category. Al alcohol is not the only substance out there whose effect is intoxication. We've got people, we've got drugs and all kinds of stuff out there that impair our judgment. And that is the problem that lies with alcohol. So any substance that would produce that effect in somebody would fall in under this uh, umbrella, if you will, of drunkenness. Revelings, which means carousing, drinking parties, lewd celebrations, gatherings where fleshly desires are commonly sought after. In modern days, drinking establishments, wild parties, drinking party, gatherings where drugs are taken, etc., etc., are what's in view here. The New International Version and the, in the English Standard Version renders this as orgies. This is probably due to the fact that the original word comes from the root word, which means to lie outstretched. Paul finish this, finishes this off with the words, and such like. Paul has provided a fairly comprehensive list 
of the sins of the flesh here for his readership to examine. There may be some similar behaviors that people would deny as falling into a specific category given by Paul. In other words, there might be some things out there that are specific, but Paul didn't didn't specify them. They might fall into this, but they weren't specified. Pornography would be an example of that. Paul eliminates the possibility of something like pornography or something else slipping through the cracks by adding anything which, like these behaviors where he said the words and such like, that may not be specifically mentioned or, you know, they're included in this. And he goes on to say, of which I forewarn you, even as, even as I did forewarn you, that they who practice such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. That they who practice such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. You cannot misunderstand that. That is, there, there, there's no difficulty with understanding that verse at all. Five-year-old can can tell you what that one means. And he makes the case right here very simple and easy to understand. Those who practice as a lifestyle any of the specific sins or anything of a similar nature will not inherit the kingdom of God. This is by inspiration from the Paul of Pen or from the pen of Paul, I'm sorry. <coughs> this is another way of saying will not live in heaven with God. Those who practice such things are not going to go to heaven. Those who are denied entrance into the kingdom of God will not be living in heaven with God for eternity. There's another passage in the Bible that's that's uh, very similar to that. If you want to turn to 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 10, that's 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 10. Some very similar words, and he and Paul is actually a little more specific in some of these. But you can just add this list to the one we just read in Galatians. You can put them both together. And he said, in starting in verse 9, Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners, will inherit the kingdom of God. So we've got both those lists now that we've put together. You might say that that's kind of, of, uh, of some of the things that fall under the category of such like that he didn't mention, that he didn't mention in the uh, Galatians text. One of the things that we want to really focus on here is that if you're having a religious discussion with somebody who is, who is of one of the denominations who who uh, advocate this idea of salvation by faith alone, you can point to this as proof that that doctrine is not true. If those who believe in this, this idea of salvation by faith alone, they will tell you that your faith alone is all that you need in order to inherit a kingdom, you know, the kingdom of God. They concentrate a lot. We talked a little bit about this last week. They concentrate a whole lot on the things that they say that, that you don't have to do in order to get into heaven. They'll say you're saved by faith alone. You don't have to be baptized. And they'll, they'll say that repentance is not really doing something, that it's all an inward thing of the heart. They, they try to make that argument. The point is they, they concentrate on the things that the Bible says you have to do to be saved, that they say that you don't, that they deny. But they don't even touch the things that the Bible says that you can't do if you want to get into heaven. In other words... You have, if you're living this lifestyle, if you are an adulterer, a fornicator, if you are, you know, a drunk, if you're a reviler, if you're an extortioner, a thief, you have to stop these things. You have to repent of these things. Verse 11, go ahead and read that for us if you've got it. Some of you, but you are washed, and 
My reference on the wharf goes back to chapter 22 of Acts, which talks about being baptized. Right. You, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and the Spirit of our God. So what that says, that these people say your faith alone, it says here you had to be washed to be justified from, right. those, from those other things. So you can't, faith alone wasn't all that you was too. That's absolutely right. There are things we have to do to be saved, and we understand that. That's something that the people of the faith alone persuasion deny, that you have to do anything. What they don't touch is the fact that here we have two lists of stuff that you that if you do will keep you out of heaven. Now, if, you're sa if, if we're saved by faith alone, and there's nothing we have to do to get into heaven beyond that, then it stands to reason that if you're saved in that fashion, and if there's nothing you have to do to get into heaven, then on the other side of the coin, there wouldn't be anything that you could do that would keep you out of heaven. It goes both ways. And this verse right here, that, 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 and, and this list of things that will keep you out of heaven here given by Paul, that speaks as much against this doctrine of salvation by faith alone as James 2. You know, of what you read in James 2, where, where, you know, by works, you know, we're justified by works and not by faith alone. Go ahead, CL. They use faith alone, but their definition of faith is either just believing in God or believing that Christ is the Son of God. Right. And these, these people that practice all these things here, they can believe in God. Well, sure. But, but faith is more than just that. It's the action. Absolutely. It's, it's just not believing in something. It's doing something about it. Yeah. They will take this idea of faith, like, like C.L. says, and they will limit that to a belief only, to, to a belief. What they're failing to do is they're failing to understand, either willingly or unwillingly, doesn't mean you know, the, the, the consequences are the same. What they're failing to understand is that this idea of faith, this biblical faith, is way beyond just a mental belief or an assent in the facts. Biblical faith, biblical faith, I mean the word, the word is a verb. And all of these things are components of faith. Not just doing the things that God says that we have to do, but not doing the things that we're not supposed to do. Things that the Bible says will keep us out of heaven. That's a very important point. And if you're having a discussion with somebody on the, on the uh, faith alone issue, you can point to these verses in Galatians and this one in Corinthians, and you can say, okay, if we're saved by faith alone, then why do we have to stop doing these? Isn't salvation by faith alone, faith alone? If we're saved by faith alone, and we don't have to do anything, and then you're going to tell me that we, there's things that we can't do? That doesn't make any sense. It's either faith alone or it's not. And if there's anything that you have to do, anything, or if there's anything you can't do, then salvation is not by faith alone. These are great verses to uh, turn to if you're having a discussion with some of those. And they also give us great comfort to know that we're, we're on a much better track than they are. I take great comfort whenever I go across these scriptures that, that verify our beliefs. <laughs> and where we stand as New Testament Christians. Anything else before we move into Galatians 5.22? If not, then Galatians 5.22, what the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness. The fruit of the Spirit here is given as the contrast to the sins of the flesh. Paul is saying that the results of what the Spirit teaches when lived and rightly applied bring about certain characteristics or behaviors which manifest themselves in a Christian. And these are, excuse me, number one, the fruit of love. That's the first one on the list. That is, in the original language, that is agape love which is a selfless, sacrificial type of love which leads oneself to act in the best interests of others. 
Okay? That's completely different from another form of love that we see in the scriptures. You know, they're very specific. The two are very specific. In the Greek language, the other word, which is the emotional type of love, is the word, is the Greek word phileo. You've got agape and you've got phileo. This type of love is one which denotes affection or personal attachment as a matter of sentiment or feelings. We have an example in Scripture where both agape and phileo are used in exactly the same context. Very easy to see from a study of that, you know, the differences between the two. If you want to turn to John 21, 15 through 17, we're going to see an example of both forms of love used in Scripture. The uh, translations just translate the words love in both instances, but it's two different Greek words. That's John 21, 15 through 17, starting in verse 15. So when they had eaten breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, now we need to, to understand that this is after the crucifixion, you know, when Jesus had been resurrected. Peter had denied Christ three times. He went fishing. He didn't know what to do. He thought it was done. He thought it was over. And Jesus went to talk to Peter, and he's there with Peter. And this is kind of the setting we have behind this. So when they had eaten breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? Do you love, that's agape. In other words, will you sacrifice yourself for me more than these? Now remember, this was after Peter had denied him three times. Put yourself in Peter's shoes and be an ask a question like that. After having denied the Savior, and then the Savior, and then Jesus Christ walks up to you and says, Peter, will you sacrifice yourself for me? Can you imagine what was going on in Peter's mind? So what does he say? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. But Peter didn't use agape. He used phileo. He couldn't use agape. If he had used agape, then the next thing that would have followed was he would have had to, you know, have at least reconciled in his own heart why he didn't sacrifice himself for Jesus when all the, when all of the really bad stuff started happening and Christ was crucified. He couldn't say it. The point here is that we've got two different forms of the word. He said, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. You know that I have affection for you, that I care for you. You know that. Jesus said to him, feed my lambs. He said to him again, being Jesus, he said to him again a second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? Agape. That's agape. Will you sacrifice yourself for me? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I care for you, that I have feelings for you. You know that I am concerned for you. But he didn't use the word agape. He said to him, Tend my sheep. And then Jesus said to him the third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? This time, Jesus changed the word that he used. Jesus changed the word from agape to, to phileo. The third time, Jesus said, do you care for me? Peter was grieved. It hurt his feelings. Why did it hurt his feelings? It hurt his feelings because he knew that he had not sac that he did not have the sacrificial type of love that Jesus was asking him about. So instead of, of confronting him on it, <clears throat> Jesus lowered himself to, to, to Peter. Kind of gave Peter an out. Okay, Peter, you, can't, you didn't sacrifice yourself. You won't sacrifice yourself for me, but do you like me? And it hurt Peter's feelings. Should. Should have. Would hurt mine. I'd be ashamed. Because he said to him the third time, 
do you love me? Phileo, do you like me? Because the third time he said, do you like me? And Peter said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I, phileo, like you. You know that I like you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. It's very significant here that Jesus asked Peter two times if he had that agape love for him. And then the third time he had to change the word in order to get an affirmative answer. And Peter was grieved. He felt bad. It hurt his feelings. And we need to keep in mind that this was after Jesus' resurrection. The point we're trying to make here is, in this lesson, is that there are two different kinds of love. There's four, actually, but we're not going to get into that. There's, there's four words for, the, for love in the Greek language, but we're talking about phileo and agape. The reason we're uh, spending a lot of time on this is that this is a fruit of the Spirit. It is not a fruit of the Spirit. There's differences. The fruit of the Spirit, the first one, is that self-sacrificing love. That is the fruit of the Spirit. This phileo love, that's not what he said. That's not a fruit of the Spirit. You have to go beyond that. The love that is the fruit of the Spirit that Paul is talking about is a love that will cause us or compel us to act in the best interest of others regardless of personal sacrifice. Kind of like the love that Jesus had for us. Did he love us? Yeah. He died on that cross for us. He did what was in our best interest, regardless of the personal sacrifice. There's a real, real detailed description of agape love. If you want to turn to 1 Corinthians 13, 1 through 7, we'll just read that in its entirety. We're almost out of time. Paul tells us exactly, if, if we want to know what this, a uh, complete understanding of this agape love, you'll see that it goes way beyond just liking somebody or an emotional feeling. That's 1 Corinthians 13, 1 through 7. Paul starts out in verse 1, Though I speak with the tongues of men and angels, but have not love, that's agape, I have become sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains, but I have not that sacrificial love, the agape love. If I don't have that kind of love, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, but I have not that sacrificing love, form of love which will cause somebody to act in the best interest of others regardless of their personal of, of, of the personal sacrifice it profits me nothing love that agape love suffers long and is kind love agape love does not envy agape love does not parade itself it is not puffed up it does not behave rudely it does not seek its own agape love is not provoked it thinks no evil does not rejoice in iniquity but rejoices in the truth agape love bears all things believes all things hopes all things and endures all things that is agape love. That's the kind of love that, that is the fruit of the Spirit. And that is a real good place for us to stop. We will pick up with the fruit of the Spirit known as joy, Lord willing, next Sunday. Thank you all so much for your attention and your comments and your participation.